Well, today we wrap up this series on my favorite book, the book of Philippians. We're in the fourth chapter now. And you might recall that Philippians was written to the church in Philippi by the Apostle Paul, who is in prison somewhere. And he writes this letter, giving them encouragement, guidance, and thanks. And as we finished up last week, Paul reminded us that we think a little differently than maybe some other people because our citizenship is in heaven. And since we belong to God, we try to look through the eyes of Christ and have the same mindset as he did. Then he continues here as he closes in the fourth chapter. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sanctiki to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. So it appears that there is a little conflict going on in the church in Philippi between uh, two women, Iodia and Syntyche. They, they disagree. They're having, they're having a little struggle. The uh, New Living Translation puts it this way. Now I appeal to you, Iodia and Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. Now, we don't know what it was about. We just knew that, know that both of these women have been co-workers with Paul in the gospel. They are uh, a known part of the church, and yet they're disagreeing. And so Paul asks, this translation says, my true companion. It may actually have been his name, because the word companion is Sisygus. And so that might have been his name. But either way, he asked somebody else in the church to help these two women resolve their differences. Because when there is conflict between people in the church, then it reduces the witness of the gospel. And it robs us of joy. You know, if you walk into a church and there's conflict, you can sense it, even if you don't know another person in that church. You just know that there's something going on. There's a, there, there's a, a sense in the air that there's conflict. And... Paul says, please, work it out. Work it out. And then he goes on. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. So this is Paul's theme throughout all of Philippians. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. You got conflict, rejoice in the Lord. You got suffering, rejoice in the Lord. God's still working on your life, rejoice in the Lord. It's always Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. You might recall that in the last chapter, Paul apologizes for uh, telling people to rejoice so much. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't apologize. He says, I know I'm just writing this over and over again, but I don't mind. It's so important. Rejoice in the Lord. And so he repeats himself. There's a, a story of a, a new pastor who has come to a church and everybody's waiting for his first sermon. And he announces that his sermon text is going to be on John 13, 34, where Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And he preached his sermon and everybody thought he was a great preacher. They were glad that he was there at the church and they couldn't wait for the next Sunday. And the next Sunday comes along and he says, My sermon text is John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And they thought, oh, I didn't realize he was doing a series. Well, uh, this is nice, but can't wait till, uh, till next week. And next week, when he announces again that he's going to be preaching on John 13, 34, people began to grumble. And one of the folks got brave and said, Pastor, uh, you, you've done a good job with with John 13, 34, but, but when are you going to preach about something else? And he says, well, when you start doing this verse, then I'll go on to another. 
Paul, just after noting the, the conflict and telling people to get together, says, rejoice in the Lord. It's his theme. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice because our faith is a faith of joy. It is a faith of love. It's a faith of great wonder with a God who is so good. He continues in verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We could do a whole, a whole sermon series on, on just those two verses. Verses 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends, or some ver versions put, passes all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Dean Telefus, who grew up in this church and who went on to have a, a great career as an NHL player and as a coach, said there was a time in his life when the anxiety was almost overwhelming. And the only way that he could get to sleep was to, to use those verses over and over again, to say them over and over again. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And he prayed over and over again until finally he'd be able to go to sleep. And, and Dean says that he got to the point finally where he only had to pray it once before God's peace would, would come upon him. And he was so excited to have, having memorized these verses and uh, that they were, they were so powerful that he went and, and he shared them with his mom. And you might uh, have known Virginia, part of this church for a long time. And he was so excited and he said, there's these verses, mom, I've memorized them, it's so important. It's, and he shared verse 6 and 7. And mom went over to the, to the cabinets and she opened up the door. And there tacked inside was a faded piece of paper. And on it was written Philippians 4, 6 and 7. It was her favorite verse too. This month I've been asking you to share your favorite verses. And um, it's on an insert here. Those of you who, uh, who shared them. They're in the, the bulletin. And I'd encourage you to look and, and see what verses have impacted some other people. Because there are so many different verses and they touch us in different ways. And, and just as Dean and, and his mom were touched by Philippians 4, um, you might be touched by one of, one of these books or one of these verses. So I encourage you to, to look through those. But if you do only get as far as... These verses in Philippians, well, you really can't go wrong because anxiety is one thing that does, in fact, does affect all of us. We worry. We get stressed out. And we need, to, we need to go over and over again because it's not kind of a one and done thing. Oh, I, rem I, I remember that verse and that's all. But it's something that we need to continue as Dean did to remind ourselves to not worry, to not be anxious, but in all situations, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, to give it over to God. And God's peace that passes all understanding will be with us. Paul continues with verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. There was a poster in the school lunchroom, and it said, you are what you eat. And I always thought that that was a rather grim place to have that poster because the uh, You'd stare at your mystery meat and your mixed vegetable mush. But I, I know if you're in food service now in the schools, it, we're, it's much better. 
It is. But that old phrase, you are what you eat, is still used quite a bit. And Paul is saying, not you are what you eat, but he's saying you are what you think. You are what you focus on. But this is not kind of the power of positive thinking that you might have heard about. Um, it's not like that, that old book, uh, The Secret, that came out, I don't know, about 15 years ago. Um, it was on Oprah, and, and uh, there's a whole big deal made about The Secret. And The Secret was, according to the book, the law of attraction. That if you think about something, the universe will give it to you. That your thoughts will attract it to you. And if you think things are good, you'll get good things. And if you think things are bad, you'll get bad things. Because the universe is going to obey your thoughts. So that was the secret. It led to a, a Saturday Night Live skit uh, interviewing this uh, uh, person from uh, Darfur over in Africa who we're there in the midst of a of terrible struggles with a militant group called the Janjaweed who was destroying their country and um, so this this positive thinking uh, law of attraction thing is being shared with this uh, person because obviously the universe is controlled by his thoughts let's take a look so when Paul tells us to think about these things whatever is noble and pure and excellent. He's not telling us that, that we somehow control the, the world and everything will be great if we just think it so. This is not the power of positive thinking. In fact, Paul doesn't think that we can control God at all. But by setting our minds on these things, rather than God being attracted to us, we are attracted to God. We draw closer to the Lord. And so he tells us to think about all those things that are godly. He says, you, you want to draw closer to God, then set your mind on things of God, on godly things, on things such as whatever is admirable, or excellent, or praiseworthy, noble, or right. Think about these things. You know, we're going to get a lot of practice um, in setting our minds on the things that are noble and pure and, and good and praiseworthy instead of on things that aren't. Because we're in an election year. And in an election year, we are going to get bombarded and have already started to get bombarded by lots of messages telling us how terrible everything is. And our country's terrible, our state's terrible, our community's terrible. Uh, hundreds of million dollars will be spent on getting us to, to think the worst. And yet, we have the opportunity in the midst of that to think of what is good and what is pure. Now, I know that, that not everything is good in our, in our society, but what area is our focus going to be? Is our focus going to be on the things that will draw us closer to God or will our focus simply be on grumbling and complaining? Because we know that Paul has, has already told us um, not to be filled with grumbling and, and anger, but instead to fill our thoughts with that which is good. So we have that choice and we'll have that opportunity. And I wonder what percentage of time during these upcoming months we will spend thinking about that which draws us closer to God and, and the things that we just want to grumble and complain about. Well, then Paul goes on and he talks about the real secret. Verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the secret. 
I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul says, no matter what the situation, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So he's content in, in all of these situations. He's not overwhelmed. As he writes this, he's sitting in prison. And yet he still tells us to rejoice. There's a, a woman who had the same kind of attitude as Paul. This, uh, but you just could never, could never get her down. Whenever you asked her how she was doing, she would say, got no complaint. I ate today. Just a cute little phrase. I got no complaint. I ate today. And it didn't matter what she ate. She could have had pizza and chocolate cake and all sorts of goodies, or she could have just had a bowl of plain oatmeal. That the response was always, that got no complaint. I ate today. And she didn't compare herself to other people either. Everyone else could be having a four-course meal, and she could be having ramen noodles, and she would still tell you, got no complaint. I ate today. So often we get caught up, we compare ourselves to others, and, and we begin to, to complain if our situation is bad. But Paul says, there's a secret. And the secret is not the power of positive thinking, the secret is the power of Christ in you. The power that Christ gives you to face any and all situations. Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So I don't know what you're going through in your life right now. Maybe you are going through a time of want. Maybe you want better health. Maybe you want healing in a relationship. Maybe you're struggling with finances. And you want to give that anxiety away, whatever. Paul says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Or maybe you have plenty. Maybe things are, are going great and you are just going to walk out here today out into that sunshine and, and you're just going to be singing a song and, and fairly skipping. I mean, I'm pretty excited today because uh, my uh, second grandchild was born on Friday night. And uh, his name was... His name is Asher. It's the uh, biblical name. It's one of the tribes of Israel. I have no idea where they came up with Asher. Um, this is not in our family, but, uh, but I'm thrilled, and I, and I can't wait to see him. So it's driving me crazy. Um, but uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the power of Christ in us. It doesn't matter whether it's wonderful and exciting and you can't wait, or whether it's dreadful and you're living with anxiety, we can do all things to Christ who strengthens us. And then he continues, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all of God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. He ends his letter, and we're reminded that this is a real letter written to real people and real situations. It is a letter that Epaphroditus will carry along with Timothy. Epaphroditus, a real person who came to Paul 
to help him out in his time of need with gifts from his brothers and sisters in Philippi. Epaphroditus nearly died in that mission, but now he is restored to health and is returning home to Philippi. Real people, real people, Yodia and Syntyche, workers in the church who are in conflict with one another and at odds. And Paul asked them to work it out, come together. Real people, like the people who are preaching with, with wrong motives. But Paul says, that's okay as long as they're preaching Christ. Real people like Paul, who is sitting in jail, and yet he says over and over again, rejoice in the Lord, always. And again I say rejoice. And he says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Whatever our right, real life situation is, Paul says, God will meet all our needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So that's the, the letter to the Philippians. If you had to draw one theme throughout the whole letter, because it shows up in every chapter, it's rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. In other words, God is not finished with you yet. He starts the letter that way. Rejoice in the Lord. He says to live as Christ and to die as gain. Rejoice in the Lord. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who didn't count his equality with God something to be, to be leveraged, but instead he came as a servant and gave his life for us, even dying on a cross so that we could live. Rejoice in the Lord, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what is ahead. Press on towards the goal of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Rejoice in the Lord. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, right, pure, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a great promise. What a great book. What a great God. Do you see why it's my favorite? Let us pray. Well, God, there's so much in the world that we could grumble and complain about. The needs are real. The situation's difficult, whether it be conflicts or struggles, hunger, being in prison. All those are real. And yet you call us to rejoice in you because you're not finished with us yet. Because... We can do all things through you. So God, we, we pray that you'd walk with us this week to face whatever we face, whether it's the, the great joys and celebrations or whether it's the struggles and difficulties or whether it's just the routine stuff of life. Help us to face it with confidence, with love, with peace, and with praise of you. Amen.